This week on Motor Week, how BMW will protect you from the searing heat, how the new Avensis Saloon shapes up against the rivals. But first, we may be enjoying spring, but in some parts of the world it's very definitely winter. This week, Mike and I have come to the Arctic Circle to learn from the Swedes some of the finer points of something they do extremely well. I'm talking, of course, about ice driving. Yes, it certainly helps if you're an expert driver, which most Swedes are. They have to learn ice driving techniques as part of their test. Another handy thing is having the right car. A cute little rear-wheel drive sports car may be just fine if you live in California. But for Sweden in winter, then how about a Volvo? Volvos are designed and built to withstand the Swedish climate. They're solid and they're safe, tough and very well equipped. For our visit to Sweden, Mike and I drove S and V 40s. There are 10 cars in the range and they're proof of Volvo's new stylish image. Cars that are now desirable not just for being safe and sensible, but for looking sexy and sleek as well. Featuring high on the list of equipment is a very effective climate control system. Electric front seats, an electrically heated rear mirror and extremely efficient headlights with their own wipers. Just perfect for coping with cold conditions. As always in a Volvo, everything has been designed with safety as a priority. One option available well worth going for is Dynamic Stability Assistance, or DSA. Or, as the Swedes like to call it, don't slip anymore. This works to control wheel spin at whatever speed you may be travelling at and whatever the road surface, wet, gravel, snow. It gives the driver greater control and, as you can imagine, is very popular in Sweden. OK, well it's all very well having the right car for the right conditions, but the way you prepare that car is extremely important in the morning. Now, we might be in northern Sweden or wherever we are, somewhere near the Arctic Circle, and it might be pretty extreme conditions here, but the conditions that apply here apply at home as well. And you need two very simple tools in the morning when the weather's like this. A simple scraper, none of that fancy stuff, just a piece of perspex, and a brush, a soft brush, which you use only for the car. Keep them in the car. Look, just look how easy this is when there's snow on the car. Same with, his, with the scraper, no fancy stuff, just a good old bit of elbow grease. Clear everything. You know, don't just clear the driver's side. I'm not doing it properly because we don't have much time, but clear your side windows as well. Look, it takes seconds to do this, and it's seconds that might save your life. The lights, very important. Always clean, brush the snow from the, the, the mirrors and the lights. Probably the most important thing is these lights and that front screen. I mean, what's the point in putting your indicators on to tell people what you're doing if your indicators are covered in snow? We've got studded tyres, thankfully. That makes me feel a lot happier. Also notice that we, we thought about it a little bit last night. When we parked this car, we parked the car this way, which means there's no awkward reversing out we simply are facing the right way, we're ready to go, but of course there's one important thing yet, and that's that we've got to bring the car up to the correct temperature. We've got to defrost that windscreen, and that means putting that heater on, we're going to get in the car and actually try and build the interior temperature up to about 18 degrees centigrade, which is the ideal temperature for driving. A little bit warmer, you get too comfortable, too lethargic, a little bit colder, your concentration goes amiss. So 18 degrees centigrade, if you haven't got an in-car thermometer, go and buy one, cost you about a fiver, worth its weight in gold. And the other thing, of course, you do not drive off until that car is thoroughly, thoroughly thawed out. And what does this come in? How does this come into the equation? Well, it's quite simple. While you're waiting for your car to demist and defrost, you just have a cuppa inside the motor. Well, after advice from our expert on how to defrost, it was time to put the car through its paces in the snow. I think that spending your life living in a freezer has sent the locals completely barking mad. The temperature's minus 11, and they've brought us into the middle of a frozen lake to drive like madmen, which was bad enough. But now I've just noticed this. There's a crack in the ice. Do you know, my mother always told me I was far too trusting. Luckily for us, we found one partially sane Swede who knew his stuff and gave Mike and I a few tips 
on how to drive on a frozen lake with a crack in it. Well, I'm joined by the lunatic that sets up these things. He's the man that arranges for the lake to be frozen. Uh, he's the man that gets all the cars here. God knows where he gets them from. God knows where he flies them in for. With the greatest respect, Robert, you've got to be slightly mad to be driving in Sweden 365 days a year, haven't you? No, you, you, it's, uh, you learn it when, you're, uh, when you start to... When you're 18 years old, it's no problems. Well, technically, yeah, legally you start at 18, but you, all got, you guys all start driving on the ice when you're about nine years old, don't you? Sometimes, yes. <laughs> that means all the time, let me tell you. No, but quite seriously, it seems to me that the big difference is between you guys and us blokes at home is that it's familiarity. You're living with it every day. Snow is not a problem. Ice is not a problem. You just take it in your stride. It doesn't stop you from doing anything, does it? No, uh, you have to... After the condi conditions, you have to... Uh, what do you say? Keep the speed after the conditions. It's yeah. Drive at an appropriate speed. Yeah. Now, we were talking last night over dinner about uh, the mistakes that people make. Let's run through some of those classic mistakes. First of all, big thing of yours, keep your distance. Yeah, that's the most important thing in the winter, keep the distance. You know, we have this two-second rule in the UK, have you heard this, where you leave a two-second gap? Yeah, that's not enough, have, is it? No, not on winter roads. No. no. We have it the same in, in uh, paved summer roads in Sweden, two or three seconds. or. Okay. Keep your distance. What about the tyres on your car? Everybody just uses it, whether they're going on their summer vacation and the weather is perfect, or they're going out in the rain or in the snow and ice, they have the same tyres. Is that an ideal scenario? In Sweden, you can't, in these conditions, you can't have uh, summer tyres. You have to get contact tyres or tyres with uh, studs. I prefer studs, okay. if it's icy. You, you even said to me last night, I seem to remember, there are some conditions where studs are essential in some icy conditions. Yeah, if it's around freezing point, it's more ice than snow, then mm. you have to get, uh, you got to have studs. All right, so a compromise might be for the people in the UK, because studded tyres are not really a reality, is contact tyres or all-weather tyres or winter tyres, they're sometimes called too? Yeah, I, I think contact tyres is there. Studded tyres for Englishmen is no. one day every fifth year yeah maybe but the trouble with those is that we might run them all winter and not see any snow we'll be wearing out those tires they're more expensive yes. uh, that's the problem isn't it, it? damage the roads as well mm. Mm. well they're in a bad enough state as they are our <laughs> roads in england uh, now what about if people are driving along and they see those nice tracks in the road should they aim for those those ruts or should they be driving on the snow where do you get the best traction the best traction you get the uh, if you have to panic break, go out from the tracks because it's usually ice mm -hmm. and try to, to reverse on the snow is better. So you get better traction by staying on the white stuff. Yeah. The traction on the ice that looks or, or, or the tarmac which it may could, have... A th it, could, it could be perfect. It yeah. could be non-ice, but you don't know. No then it's better to take the snow. Okay. What about four-wheel drive? Everybody in Britain thinks that as long as they've got a four-wheel drive car, they'll live forever. Have four-wheel drive, wear a condom, you'll never die. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't drive. Forget the condom bit. Yeah, I don't uh, drive uh, four-wheel drive. I, if, if you're living in a hilly, lots of hills and mountains, that, then it's okay, but I don't think you need it. All right, what about front-wheel drive or rear-wheel drive? Front-wheel drive is better for people who can't drive. Yeah. The, like the, the ordinary <laughs> I was that bad. <laughs> uh, the only thing you have to take care of when you, when it's like this in England, or it's just take it easy and, and uh, keep the distance. And smoothness, smoothness, smoothness. Yeah. smoothness. No fast turns, uh, fast braking right. if you don't have ABS. So no violence with the wheel no. or the pedals yeah. or anything. Just a silky, silky smooth. Yeah. The other thing is, and it's a question I'm often asked, you know, and people are terrified by it, believe me, in the UK, you know, what happens if my car goes into a skid? What do I do? Can you give them some very, very basic rules? I know it, it's dangerous to give advice like this, but uh, what, are, what are some tips? If you're driving along, your wheels lock up, your car is out of control, yeah. you have no steering, what should you do? Uh, let the brake, <laughs> lose the brake. Come I mean, off the brake? Yeah, come off the brake. If you don't have uh, the ABS system, you have to, if you're panic braking, you have to 
do like this. Uh, cadence breaking? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it, if you put it uh, down all the way, you can't steer it, then you're gone. Yeah. But what is the cure? You come off the brake, try to regain the steering, yeah, yeah. and then maybe back yeah, on the brake yeah, again yeah, later. Yeah. Yeah. All fast, like an ABS system. Yeah, okay. On off, on off, all, all right. the time and steering. But the, at the end of the day, slow down, more distance, yeah. and silky smooth. Yeah. You can see Mr Rutherford giving it loads right behind my shoulder there and now it's my turn to get some expert lessons from the top Swedish driver. But then all Swedes seem to be fantastic drivers anyway. The thing you have to do is don't do like that. Straight up. <laughs> slow movement. Slow, slow movement. And try to be uh, near, near the cones. Yeah. Near the cones. Yeah. Near the cones. Near the cones. Am I near enough? Yeah. There you go, easy if you know how. Well, easy in the right car with a bit of expert tuition. I'll never complain about half an inch of slush again. With summer on its way, we're soon going to experience the searing desert-like temperature inside parked cars when we get back inside. Leather seats and plastic components such as the dashboard can be painful to touch. Aircon's a must, but it takes a few minutes to kick in. Well, the BMW 5 Series now has the answer to this. An infrared reflecting windscreen. After 90 minutes exposure to the hot sun, the surface temperature on the dash panel is reduced by 10 degrees Celsius. This is but one way a BMW can make the driving environment more comfortable and therefore safer. Powerful air conditioning and a timer to vent interior air prior to your return are now standard on the 7, 8 and now most 5 series SE models. And it's anticipated that the infrared reflecting windscreens will be available in a few months time at a price of about £200. Last year, Deo launched three new models, the Lanos, Nubira and the Laganza, at the same time replacing its entire range, an unprecedented move by a manufacturer. The Lanos is the smallest of the newcomers, ranging from 8795 for the 1.4S three-door to 11195 for the 1.6 SX five-door. This 1.6 SX three-door comes for 10,695. The driving environment is comfortable enough. The dashboard design is attractive, well laid out, but it's the interior where the low cost betrays itself. The plastics used are of a quality harking back to the old Airfix kits you would put together in your youth. Tap them with your fingers and you get a hard, hollow sound you'd never find on European designs. Which is a pity, really, because it's actually screwed together extremely well. It's only these materials which let it down. Rear seat passengers suffer slightly, legroom being somewhat disappointing, unlike the boot, which is cavernous by comparison. The exterior is quite attractive, although the grille gets mixed reactions. Some like it, others feel that it detracts from the otherwise cohesive shape. The drive is a pleasant surprise, the engine being largely responsible for this, it's nothing short of a revelation. You rarely expect much from the engine in a bargain car such as this, but the Deo unit pulls strongly right through the rev range. The chassis gives a nice compromise between ride and handling in most conditions, although mid-corner bumps can unsettle the Lanos when pressing on, and it does feel floaty over motorway dips and expansion joints. But to the average driver on the average road, the driving experience will prove both comfortable and secure. 
Overall, the Lanos shows a growing maturity in the Deu range. Certainly the equipment and design stand up to comparison. The chassis is alright and the engine is a gem. If the issue of the cheap plastics is addressed, then Deu will have nothing to apologize for in the company of more expensive rivals. Now, for me, driving and reporting on cars is a great deal of fun. There are some cars you can't wait to get out for a spin in, other cars you think, well, it's not really the sort of car for me. Now, Toyota have a reputation for building very fine cars, solid and reliable, but not the sort of cars with their mass market vehicles that are going to set the world on fire. And the Carina was one such car, a car about as interesting as watching paint dry or maybe finding out what sort of sandwiches you had in your lunchbox that day. Now, the Carina's replacement is this, the all-new Avensis. Yes, I said Avensis. What does it stand for? What does it mean? We don't know, but this is the car. Now, in the six years that the Carina was around, Toyota sold 125,000 models, and this year Toyota predicts sales of the new Avensis at around 25,000. And for sure, it'll be a big player in the fleet market. And I doubt its claims that this is an upper medium class car. Toyota are running a very smooth TV ad at the moment for the Avensis, making it look very spacious and very glamorous. Well, is it? I'm not so sure. I think it's rather bland in the styling, apart from these rather snazzy headlights at the front, which a lot of car manufacturers are going for. But what's the interior like? Well, let's take a look. Now inside this 1.8 GS model, you're cosseted by airbags, quite literally. There's one for the driver, there's one for the passenger, and there's side airbags as well. And Toyota tell us that the airbags for the driver and passenger are a lot bigger than they were in the Carina. For instance, a 60 litre airbag for the driver and a 110 litre airbag for the passenger. There's also a rather snazzy CD radio cassette machine which looks rather difficult to steer, looks as though it's been made for the car in fact. That's very smart. There's an alarm, immobilizer, air conditioning and a sunroof. And what do you think about the interior in the Avensis? Well at first I thought it was rather garish but I have to say it has grown on me a little bit this rather odd pattern on the seating, but I'm still not convinced about it. And why, oh why, do car manufacturers insist on giving us these huge expanses of grey plastic on the dashboard? Surely, surely they could come up with something a lot better. And how about this for a touch of style, supposedly anyway on the Avensis, this so-called wood effect around the centre console. And it is purely just for effect. I don't think that has ever seen the inside of a tree. So what about the engines on the new Avensis? Well, there are four. There's a 1.6 litre 16 valve lean burn. There's this, which is the 1.8 litre 16 valve lean burn. There's a two litre and a two litre diesel. And also new to the Avensis range is a brand new ignition system, which called Toyota Direct Ignition or TDI. It makes the engine more reliable. It reduces electromagnetic interference and also helps with ignition timing as well. Now this 1.8 litre produces 108 brake horsepower, so it's quite respectable. And I have to say, I've been driving it around for a few weeks and either it's very economical or there's something wrong with the fuel gauge because the needle has hardly moved in the past few days. It should give a combined figure of around 38 miles per gallon, a top speed of 119 miles per hour and 0 to 60 time in around 11 seconds. On the road, the car goes well, the engine revs freely, but one thing I have noticed with this car is a slight lag in the acceleration, the sort you sometimes get on turbos. Just a slight hesitation, maybe it's just on our test car, I certainly hope so for Toyota's sake. The handling is not that impressive, I have to say. Pushing the car hard through twisty country lanes makes you realise it ain't a sports car, but its brakes are good and the seating position is fine. Rear seat passengers don't fare too bad with a reasonable amount of room, plus a rather snazzy armrest that incorporates a tray and of course the customary drink holders. Toyota claim luggage space to be good for this size of car, although you might be best going for the hatchback or estate if that's critical for you. Now the Avensis is up against some very tough competitors in the form of the Mondeo, the Vectra, the Laguna and the Peugeot 406. And for me personally, I think I'd choose one of those cars over the Avensis. Toyota can bang on forever about the great reliability and the quality and value for money that they give. All important factors, of course. But for sheer driving pleasure, 
I think I'd choose one of those rivals. Now this 1.8 GS saloon is £15,115 on the road. Great value for money. And the Avensis range starts at just under £14,000, rising to just over £20,000. You get a choice of saloon, hatchback and estate, manual or automatic, and a choice of four engines too. One big plus point though for the Avensis is the fact that this car is built here in Britain in Derbyshire. And that's great for jobs, it's great for the economy. But you just can't get away from that dull Carina image. Ford have announced that production of the Scorpio will cease in July. Sales of executive class cars like the Scorpio and Vauxhall Omega have been heavily squeezed by increasingly competitive luxury brands such as BMW's 5 Series and of course the new Audi A6. And by improved refinement in the class below, so it's not a great surprise to industry watchers that the Scorpio is going. However, there will be Scorpios available at your local Ford dealer as remaining stocks are used up, and if you can put up with its acquired looks, it's not bad value. The Volkswagen Multivan is nearly £1,000 cheaper. Good news for the family buyer, as Volkswagen have announced a £981 reduction in the price of this MPV, so you could buy the economical 2.4 SD for £19,795, rising to around £23,000 for the 2.8 VR6 automatic. We featured this model late last year and were impressed by its versatility. Unlike other MPVs which try to distance themselves from the van image, the multivan merely takes advantage of the space created by its origins, with the option of folding the rear seats to make a bed, amongst other novel features. And Volkswagen have confirmed when the new Golf will reach the UK. The first cars will be with dealers in mid-May. And the first arrivals will be the 1.6-litre petrol and 1.9-litre turbo-diesel five-door models. Other models will filter through throughout the summer months. Although delayed in reaching the UK, prices will be held at the levels announced back in October, starting at £11,970 for the 1.4e and rising to £17,735 for the 1.8-litre turbocharged GTI. Finally, the Lexus LS400 fought off competitors from Jaguar, Audi, BMW and Mercedes to win the best luxury car prize at this year's Fleet News Awards. The judges were influenced by the impressive level of quality and reports of total reliability. More from Motorweek next week.